It's playtime! <laughs> It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! <laughs> Welcome everyone to another edition of Pod from the Crips interview series. This is Chris Guzzo along with my co-host Anthony Balzano. Today we have a treat for you. Here to join us on our podcast is special effects artist Alec Gillis. Alec, how are you doing today? I'm good, guys. Thank you for having me. Thank you, man. Thank of you course, for coming thank on. Thank you for coming We on. were excited for this one. I was, I was dying for you to come on. I was. Al- <laughs> Alec is the co-founder of the Creatures FX Studio, Amalgamated Dynamics Incorporated. He's created many, many creature designs, including It, Tremors, Pumpkinhead, Predator. He was nominated for two visual effects Oscars, including Starship, Tro- Starship Troopers and Alien 3. You got to also check out his YouTube channel. It's called Studio ADI. It has over 272,000 subscribers. We're going to attach the link to the uh, description below. If you guys are interested in like what goes into movie making in, in the sense of uh, monsters and how they create them. Please check out this YouTube channel. It's really awesome. I just want to uh, mention today that we have, we're going to talk about this short film that I came across about two months ago. My friend Rob, who's, he couldn't be on the podcast today, but he sent it to me. It's called Playtime. It was made last year, uh, 2019. It was written and directed by Alec. And I, I feel like this was the perfect mesh of like comedy into horror. So I don't really want to spoil it for any of the fans. I'm going to let you talk about this, uh, this short film. This thing is awesome. Take it away, Alec. Yeah, I really love that you guys like the film. First of all, thank you so much for um, <clears throat> giving it a shout out. Cause you never know when you do something like that. It's a labor of love. And, you know, even though we have a big presence on our YouTube channel, you know, we, we have like 160 million views on our on our, um, wow. our videos. Our videos tend to be behind the scenes stuff. So when you put up something that's narrative and is a film itself and kind of, you know, introduces a new character, um, you just don't know how it's going to land or if it's going to land. And of course, I'm reading all the comments and wondering like, do they have any jokes? Do they, you know, and that, that'll drive you crazy. Uh, uh, you know, but um, but um, it's gotten a good reaction, um, and I'm and I'm grateful for that because I think there's a lot of fans out there that get it. But yeah, as you said, you know, I wanted to do something that um, kind of peeled back the layers of uh, movie making, and specifically, what if you had a Chucky type puppet <laughs> who is a has been, right? And and it and, and it's actually autobiographical. <laughs> because if you work in the practical effects business, you've seen the business change. And even though you have a lot of uh, fans, and there's people that love the technique, you're still in Hollywood. You're still sort of like in the back seat. You know, you're no longer driving the bus uh, you, because you're sort of like a, um, yeah, well, you, in, the, in the big movies, there's not, a, there's not as much room for practical effects as there used to be because it's so digital prolific. Not so on the smaller movies, there's plenty of practical effects going on. But that was just kind of my feeling at the time, like, hey, I'm kind of like a, like an, old, an animatronic puppet from the 80s that can't find work because there's a digital, you know. So I got to, I got to play on that and incorporate, um, you know, some of those, put it in a comedic sense. But hopefully there was some heart to it, too, if you felt that, I hope. There was a lot of heart to this this movie, and I, I really appreciate it because a lot of short films doesn't include this, that the character Billy, so he was kind of the Chucky doll in this movie, he had a character arc, yeah. and he kind of learned a, a lesson. Um, can I kind of tell him what, what sure, I... Sure, tell him anything, tell him anything. I, 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 th- I felt that um, he, you know, he learned at the end of the movie that he didn't need Hollywood, that he, he already had these fans and these people all over the world had this nostalgia for Billy. And, uh, you know, I I resonate with that because I love 80s movies and I love special effects, practical effects. 
And a lot of times when I watch films today, especially in the horror genre, a lot of times I feel like, oh, this, this is not real. Or this seems fake. And uh, it just doesn't beat what happened in like the 70s and the 80s and the 90s when they didn't have that kind of technology. Yeah. And um, the, uh, okay, I'm sorry, were you saying something? No, I was just going to agree with you wholeheartedly. You know, in 2011, um, we did The Thing, uh, the, you know, 2011, the prequel to the great Carpenter film. And um, most of our work had been replaced did, uh, by digital work. Um, and in fact, if you go on our website, you can see some videos that we posted. Because uh, people started asking us, like, well, did you guys screw up? What happened? And we're like, right. damn it. no, you know, we did great stuff. So we waited for the movie to come and go, do its business. We're, we're big believers in supporting the film, no matter what. But um, we posted a video on our YouTube channel about the, the effects that we did. And it was just, it just went big. I mean, it's got millions and millions of views. And people started, uh, you know, really cut, it sunk in like what, what was happening uh, in, in our part of the um, business. And people were really distraught about it. And honestly, after the thing, Tom and I, my partner, Tom Woodruff and I were thinking like, well, maybe it, this is it. Maybe practical effects are done, creature effects, animatronics, maybe that's done. Maybe we should just close it up. But because of that fan outpouring and that, all that support that we were seeing, we're like, no, screw this. We're, we're not done. We're, we, you know, we got a lot more in us. We got a lot more. There's much more to, to say with practical effects, new creatures to build. So that kind of was what I wanted to do with Playtime was like give a shout out to the fans who support us emotionally. Mm. <clears throat> and if we had not been aware of that, you know, we, we might have uh, gone a different direction. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely, Playtime is definitely, uh, uh, it's, it's for the fans and it's for the people who know, you know, what it's like to, to try to champion an art uh, in a world that uh, sometimes doesn't, a business, I should say, mm. doesn't feel like it wants you that much. But the fans want us, so there's value in that. That's, that's great that you said that it's a, it's a business and it's more of a business than, a, than an art. And I, I was going to ask you, what, what is like one of the main reasons why they shifted to, uh, to CGI and got rid of animatronics and stop motion? Well, yeah, initially, um, you know, after Jurassic Park, you know, that, that made such a splash that, um, you know, people sort of like, it, it, you know, naturally it's, it's movies. So people want to go for the newest, hottest, sexiest thing. So, <laughs> so CGI had sizzle, you know, so they did just go right to it. Like I remember on Mortal Kombat, we did Goro, the four-armed guy, right. you know, and that was a very grueling build. And, and it was, you know, it was tough. And the producers on that movie just, um, they didn't like Goro. It was, it was a big hassle to use. We had 10 puppeteers, all this stuff. What they were really most excited about was the character of Reptile because it was a digital thing. And they were like, oh, ooh, digital, digital. Yeah, Goro, big deal. It's a big pain in the butt, right? When you look at that film now, and I've heard this from Richard Taylor and Peter Jackson from Weta, when you look at that film now, and even then, Reptile doesn't look good. Reptile has not aged well. It looks like a cartoon. And Goro, it looks like he's there, right? Even though you may go, oh, yeah, he looks like he's some kind of a, 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 a robot or a whatever whatever he's there and he has fans right reptile has no fans so I, in retrospect I, I i look back on that and i and i say that was sort of like the mindset the beginning of the mindset that animatronics is is a second class citizen we have to go for digital because it's awesome but then once we started seeing a, a pendulum shift shift back and filmmakers themselves i never have a problem with filmmakers directors come through and they go like, you know, I want what you guys do because my favorite movies had this stuff in it. Mm. And you can look back on aliens and look at that queen alien and go, God damn, she still holds <laughs> up. If you look at, as we said, digital from, from its beginnings with some exceptions like Jurassic Park and all those, but digital, it doesn't hold up now, right? Because the, the technology has improved and, and, and it's, and it's a great, it's a great technique now, but so what is it? What's the disconnect then? Why do directors want to use practical effects, but studios do not? And I finally got a good answer 
Because a lot of times you ask those questions, you have to ask them carefully of studio executives because they think that, uh, they might think that you're just angling or something. You know, you have to have a relationship with them and say, hey, help me out here. Businessman to businessman, why is this happening? And there was a guy named um, John, um, oh shit, I'll remember his name. He was at Universal. He's, I think he passed away now. But he was a great guy. He did all of Del Toro movies. He was the executive in charge of effects or, or production or something. John Swallow, great guy. He was like Wilford Brimley. That's what he looked like and he talked like that. <laughs> and I'd say, how come you guys don't, how come studios aren't using uh, animatronics or, or you know, practical as much? And he said, because we don't want to pay for it twice. Said, what do you mean? He said that what tends to happen is that they'll decide, you know, they'll go practical build the creature, shoot it, start testing it with test audiences, and somewhere along the line, directors will change their mind and go, God damn it, if it only had wings, or if this was a completely different concept. And, by, and if you're changing the concept radically in post-production, you, you cannot do practical effects because our build time takes too long. You gotta get a crew back together to shoot it, but you can do digital effects because you've shot safety plates without people or, or creatures in them so that you can drop those digital things in later. And as a result, by the way, oftentimes those digital, um, the digital work isn't very good because they're not giving the digital artists enough time at the last minute to replace it. So those guys are going, the digital artists are saying, please don't replace this stuff, right? Um, but anyway, John Swallow um, pointed that out, that he, he doesn't want to pay for it twice. In other words, he doesn't want to build the practical effects only to have to replace it. He said he, there's only a couple of directors he'll trust, and one of them was Del Toro, because that guy will make a decision and he'll stick with it and won't change his mind. The only thing I think that John Swallow left out in that equation is that the studio, studios have in the last uh, probably, I don't know, 15, maybe 20 years, their model has been to shorten pre-production times because they have to, they're taking out a line of credit, right? They've got a line of credit with the bank Leonese or some, whoever they've got their line of credit with. As soon as they draw that money out, they're paying big dollars on that money. So if they can delay that for a few months and, and not start cutting checks or too early, they can save money on interest and all that kind of stuff. So as a result, our art, which relies on pre-production suffers because we don't have enough time to do it. Uh, and, 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 then, and that either means that they're like worried that we don't have enough time, so they don't want to commit the money to it. So they'll give you a little bit of money, but not enough to really do a great job. Or they'll just say, forget it. We're not doing it that way. We're doing it in post-production. Um, and that's not an artistic decision. And that's nothing personal either. You know, like, like I used to get you know, personally insulted when my art was passed over. But the reality is these are business decisions and, and they don't really care about... Um, my feelings or about the, the the art necessarily and then directors aren't always in a position to fight that fight for you because they have to fight a thousand fights with the studio and they're like mm, do i <clears throat> do i blow my ammunition on this phase this early in the in the in the movie or do i wait and save my ammo for casting arguments or editing arguments or whatever the hell right, right? So we tend, you know, the, unless a director has real power over the studio uh, or is given granted power uh, at the studio, um, they can't really necessarily sway the, uh, the, the, the thing in our direction. But that's what I like about lower budget movies because lower budget movies just simply don't have the money for CGI because CGI is still much more expensive than practical effects. So they don't have the money for it. So by default, it's the 80s again, and we get to do our, our, our practical effects in, in lower budget films. That's, that's um, awesome. Alec, uh, Alec uh, I wanted to tell you, Rob, because I've been, I've been upset about this for so long. I tell my friends all the time, I'm like, the people who make these decisions and like Universal and Hollywood um, for these movies, like, don't they realize that when they make all these remakes of classics and just watching films that were like, a hundred to three hundred thousand dollars in budget are clearly the better movie than what's going on today. So I feel like why not just stick to practical effects instead of CGI? It doesn't make any sense to me. 
Um, yeah, the, like I, I usually try to encourage people who are outside the industry to not um, fall into the trap of, and not that you're doing this, but uh, of, of saying, um, you know, ah, those dumb shits, you know, what, what the fuck, they're idiots, they're this, they're that. They're just working on a different um, set of parameters than the fans are, right? Like their parameters are, um, you know, this is going, we need a, like, we're, we're not going to make a, this is not a low budget movie, right? Because it's got, um, <clears throat> what, pick your stars, you know, it's got Robert Pattinson in it, or it's got somebody. And, and along with that scale of cast comes money and a bunch of producers that also have fees. So it's not uncommon then for a, for a movie to be, uh, you know, 50 million bucks, you know, um, and, and, and once you start spending all that money, it, it's a bigger machine, right? And it's not necessarily a labor of love. And so you got to like, in order to get that movie green lit, you got to package the, all the elements together in a way that a studio can sign off on it, right? And go, okay, we'll pay that, we'll pay that money. So if you've got everything and then you say, um, and we want to do it old school, this is what happened with The Thing, 2011. Everybody was everybody in production that I talked to was on board with doing about eighty percent of the film's effects as practical and twenty percent as digital, a support technique, and to do things that we couldn't do, right? Which would be bitching. I thought it'd be a great, you know, within the frame you would have you'd have practical foundation of things plus weird bubbling skin that you could be added digitally or what have you. And that in the course of it, that flipped and it flipped not, I don't think it flipped because of the filmmakers. The, the director was very much into that and he was very, <clears throat> very um, much of a stickler of accuracy to the Carpenter film and all that. But it's coming from the studio level. So, so where I would say that my disagreement with studio heads come in is that they're looking at things in a kind of business sense and they are not catering to the fans and yeah i agree like if you're going to remake a movie and you're ignoring the fan base then you're probably ignoring what made that movie great to begin with you're just thinking it's it's uh, well it's okay it's the thing right so uh, yeah we get it we get it. it's a monster hides and people blah 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 okay great but they don't but these but executives aren't steeped in this stuff like we are from childhood where we're watching those movies over and over and finding all the nuances and talking to people about they don't, they're not doing that they're also producing that and they're producing a rom-com and they're producing a historical drama and they're, and so they're generalists right so they don't they don't put much stock in quite honestly they don't put much stock in what rabid fans have to say you know they 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 don't in fact um i can tell you two instances where, where I, I won't i won't say uh exactly i won't name names but <clears throat> smart people executives are smart people but like i'll say we were doing one um, one movie and i'm i'm like how uh, you know it was based on um anime stuff and and there was a big character in it and, and so i'm saying how close to the source material do you want us to say and the guy said, oh, fuck the source material, right? We're making, a, <laughs> we're making a movie here, guys. Listen, it isn't about, it's not a dumb cartoon anymore. It's mm -hmm. not a stupid comic book. This isn't a 1980s movie. We're making a modern film that, that, is got, that we want it to go big, right? We got to do this right, guys. We got to do this big and we got to do it right. So put aside all of your little baggage from your childhood and let's think in the here and now and let's develop this in the way that is really going to be cool. You know, it's going to be cool right? Like all that stuff. And then you're like, oh boy, this person does not know anything about this. <laughs> and, and it's probably they're, they're veering away from the source material because they're unfamiliar with it. They don't, they don't have the time or don't want to take the time to familiarize themselves with it. You know? I think that theme comes clear across in, in playtime. I, I love when uh, Billy goes to the, uh, well, I think you're playing him, right? I, I, his name's not Roger Corman, but it, it's, it's yeah, supposed it's, to be uh, not Roger Corman. Robert Corman. Robert Corman. Okay. Which, I didn't know which, if it was a nod or not. Oh yeah. Well, I, cause I started with Corman. I'm, I'm right. Very, right. So I, but and it, it wasn't, it, in retrospect, I'm like, Oh, do people think I'm bashing Roger Corman? Not the case. I'm bashing all other producers, but not Roger Corman. 
Right. I, I just, but it did come across that theme of like that Hollywood is cutthroat and like you're as good as like you, you know, your next job. And like yeah. once you're not good, they don't need you anymore. And like yeah. it really captures that, that theme of like, we really don't give a shit about you unless you have something to offer. Yeah. And I, you know, I, that's where I sympathize with the character when he, when he tells him, we can't even, you're not even allowed to use your name anymore because we own it. We trademarked yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Much of that stuff in that conversation um, where I'm the producer is stuff that I've actually heard, or it's, it's a paraphrasing of stuff I've actually heard. Like I've heard, I heard back in the day, producers, uh, a producer saying uh, that uh, they really loved that um, digital job of the hut that George added. And wasn't that great? <laughs> I also heard a, um, <laughs> once when i said hey uh, they, you know they sent a script over and there's tons of monster stuff in it and i'm like hey so you know this is this is great opportunities we could do a lot of great stuff and they go oh we just all we want you to do is a pair of claws to grab someone the rest is going to be digital and i said oh what made you decide that and she said well i don't know if you've looked but the um the gaming industry is makes a lot more money each year than the movie industry. So we want to get that aesthetic in our movie. Mm. So I'm like, you know that I didn't, you know, what are you, what are you going to say to that? I said, well, you know, I, I would have concerns about something that really literally looks like a video game being in your horror movie because it knocks fans out of the reality. And they're like, uh-huh, well, thank you. Anyway, the hands <laughs> that we need uh, have to grab, you know. So, um, so there's a kind of a myopic, thing and they cut they're uh, they're like herd animals you know they're just sort of going like go, go run to that run and, and, and with exceptions there are visionary people obviously who, who do amazing things even in, in big budget stuff and and w once they get their cachet they can you know maybe translate that maybe use it against these forces of uh, mediocrity and sameness that uh that permeate i'm sure they permeate all businesses but it's a drag when it's in a creative business because as you said, some $300,000 movie, it follows or whatever, you know, uh, right. could, be, could be way better than a, a big, uh, you know, a big studio movie. But so you think like, well, we'll just make 20 of those movies. And even if those little movies, even if 15 of them suck, and oftentimes they do, you still have, <laughs> you'll have the possibility of five that are going to be freaking great, you know. But then having said that, you get um, movies like um, Midsummer. I finally saw that. Oh, recently. We just reviewed it. We just it. did a podcast. We just on did a podcast episodes. on it. Yeah, that's a great movie, and that's not a cheap movie. Yeah. I don't know how much it cost, but so it somebody, is, somebody it is considered low budget though. But it, uh, how much? Name? Ari Aster directed it, and he has a great DP. I can't think of his name off the top of my head, but mm -hmm. yeah, it was it was made for a few million, like you were saying. Do you, do you think it was only a few million, or was it more like fifteen million? Like, I don't know, yeah, I mean, 15 the, the cinematography was amazing in that movie. Fantastic. But like, even to get somebody to commit 15 million bucks on a bizarre concept like that, right? Where you got to pitch to like, how do you even pitch that look to a bunch of people who are, you know, money people or executives? That, that, that's a really great, or what about The Lighthouse, right? Like, yes. Or, but the Lighthouse, another, that's not a cheap movie either. Cheaper than cheaper than a lot of big studio films, but it's not a three hundred thousand dollar movie. Um, so somebody out there is taking chances uh, and 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 making bigger movies uh, that you know have practical stuff in them. And um, I don't know. Both both those movies that you mentioned, the uh, production company is A twenty four. So I'm mm -hmm. a huge fan of A twenty four movies. They they also did uh, Hereditary, who is also yeah. Ari Aster, and Unc Uncut Gems. So they they make these these uh, these movies that are very uh, edgy yeah. and uh, yeah. they're not you know typical or cliche. Mm -hmm. I w I wanted to ask you because you've been around the uh, the industry for a while, and back to what you were saying. Did that used to bother you when you, you know, you proposed something that was creative or like you really believed in a project and a producer or somebody else would come on and say, no, scrap that. We're not doing it. And like, you're like, but this is what this is. And I mean, do you well, become jaded over uh, time? I, I always, uh, it's, it's a funny thing. Cause like, you know, I started when I was 20. Mm. So here I am at age 40 
<laughs> you look great for your age. You look good. <laughs> I've, been, I've been doing this for 40 years, guys. So, so, and I'm still enthusiastic about it. But when I started as a, as a 20 year old, you know, just as far down in the ranks at Roger Corman's as you could be, um, I would get very passionate and very excited about, uh, about, about something. If I had an idea and I did but in the early days of my career, if it was dismissed, I'd go like, oh, well, you know, they're not listening to me because I'm a kid. But I know at some point I'll, I'll work my way into where people are going to listen to me. Then you get into that period, that phase where you are accomplished, where you're, you know, winning Oscars and getting nominated and you're working on cool movies and all that stuff. And um, you, your ideas are still going to get dismissed. But at that point, uh, you know, for me, I've always been, a professional so i always think um you know it, this is my job is to do the best i can for the director right and if the director embraces something great if they don't that's fine too uh, i've got more ideas and i'll have more ideas for other projects down the line so now so i didn't really like even when when our work was cut from the thing that was probably the most painful sort of dismissiveness of, of our of our work because i knew that the work was was very good what we did but even at that point you go this is what i signed up for i, I know i don't have contractual control over editing or any, i don't have that control to stop someone from completely cutting my work out of the film and i know that and that's what i take i got paid for it i did great stuff i'll throw the throw the video up on on youtube for people to enjoy and that's that it's in my own personal work, like in playtime, right. where I can make those decisions myself and I can decide which of my ideas work and which don't. And, and, and that's what you do. I, I tell this to, to um, young people, you know, who, when they say about portfolio, you know, what, how do I build a portfolio? What right. do I do? So, and I usually say, show if you've worked on movies, show what you did on that movie. But what's more important to me when I'm evaluating a, um, a portfolio is I want to see what you do on your kitchen table. Show me your passion project because that reveals more about you as an artist than anything you've done uh, as a commercial artist. Uh, so, so that's the full picture. So uh, we, we, if, you're, if your ideas are dismissed, use them somewhere else. You know, um, Get your own projects going and use those ideas in, in, in those projects. There's no such thing as a wasted idea. And what's the point of being negative and pissed off at somebody for not taking your genius idea? Don't they know who I think I am? You know. <laughs> <laughs> right. No. Um, for, so playtime, was it like a collaboration over like a, a few years that you kept thinking of this idea and it was itching or did you? Oh, no, I, I, I think I wrote the script in about 2015. Okay. And I had to scrape some money together to do it. And I, it was basically, I was doing it in between projects and was it 2019 that it came out or was it was it, it earlier than that? It says on IMDb, but correct me if I'm wrong. If it's not 2019, it said I feel like it started in, uh, maybe it was 2018. I think it took me about three years to do it. Okay. But, it's not, but these are the kind of things where like, uh, you know, three years in the making. Yeah, but that was like weekends and, you know, after hours and all that stuff. And then we'd shoot in blocks, you know, I'd, I'd pull the resources together to shoot a scene and then we'd come back in a month and shoot another scene. And it really didn't matter if the puppet looked a little crappy because he was supposed to look pretty crappy. <laughs> Can I ask you something about the puppet? I, I, well, this is one of my questions. When he's like torn and haggard, is it supposed to be because like the skin deteriorates over time? Yeah. Or is he like a drug addict where he's been, he used all his money up or? <laughs> well, <laughs> all of the above, you know, like I, I just like the idea that, yeah, latex rots and falls right. apart. So he's never had a makeover since the 80s, right? And he's <laughs> living in his little apartment. So it's it's the analogy works in both both ways. He's not been taking care of himself. And then he goes to to uh, to the guy who built him, who's played. But did you know who played that guy? Yeah, I was gonna get to that too. That Kevin Yeager, which is like yeah. one of my favorites as well. Do, Anthony, it, all the fans out there who doesn't know who Kevin Yeager is, he did he he created the uh, Child's Play doll. He did the makeup for Elm Street 2, 3, and 4, and he was the director. We, we briefly mentioned him in one of our other podcasts for Hellraiser 4, which, mm -hmm. which I, I love that movie. He, that was one of the, the movies he directed. But he's yeah. famous for the Chucky doll and for many the, other things, tons of stuff. Yeah, tons of stuff. Just most recently, the new Bill and Ted's movie. It's yes. 
age makeups. Phenomenal old age makeups. If you get a chance on my YouTube channel, there's, a, there's old footage from us, because I've known Kevin since about 84. And um, there's us when we're even younger than you guys. I think we're, Kevin was about 22 or 23, but I was the subject and he put this old age make, created this old age makeup that was kind of, it was on the, it was in Fangoria at the time. And, you know, uh, Dick Smith was blown away by it. Stan Winston's blown away by it. So Kevin has been like an amazing talent and we've been buddies since, since the eighties. So I asked him if he would play himself. That was my idea was to play Kevin Yeager. Right. And um, he was like, ah, I don't, don't want to play me. That feels like uh, his, he's a kind of a humble guy, right? So he wanted to play, a, he wanted to, can I play a character? So we came up with this idea that he would play Kevin Yeager's brother, Carl. Who, <laughs> right. Who is his less talented brother. And I'm like, oh, that's, that's perfect. Like, it'll just be a little, a little uh, subtle thing. But Chucky, Kevin, <laughs> Carl Yeager is jealous of Kevin Yeager in the way that his creation, Billy, is jealous of Chucky. So they mention each other's names. Yeah, I'll, I'll say hi to your brother Kevin. Say hi to Chucky for me while you're there. So there's right. that kind of like animosity behind the scenes, the animosity. But Kevin did a great job of that because he's a, he's a really great. God, I should show you guys some links of some other short films I've done. You might like those. Yeah, we definitely what did, love it. What did you think of the most recent Child's Play, Alec? I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. Okay. I think well, one that from a, a few child's plays ago, but I, I haven't, uh, I, I really haven't seen it. I, I, I don't know. I, I guess, uh, why haven't I seen it? I haven't gone out of my way. That's all. What did you think of it? Um, it, I mean, it went in a different like direction, like for more like modernized like technology, which I really wasn't about at all. Cause I just feel like don't take an original classic movie like child's play and then make it into something completely different with the same doll. I feel like if you want to do a different story, then get your own doll or do something else. So I didn't like the movie at all. Was it like an AI chip or something? Is it yeah, that? yeah. It yeah, was. it was like that, yeah. I, I was going to actually ask you if, like, when people come to you with their ideas for creatures, is it, like, the horror genre kind of shifting to more of, like, technology and, like, the monster comes out of the cell phone or the monster comes out of the kind of computer? Because... Speaking of child's play, like the 80s, the, the whole movie was based off of the craze of, uh, you know, of a new toy. And when I was a kid, I remember toys were huge. And now everything is computerized. And I feel like a lot of the horror is like what scares you from your iPhone or what scares you from, uh, like I said, yeah. from your laptop. And I was just curious if, if they people come to you and ask you to create those kind of monsters. It's they don't, they, might, they don't really come to me for, with that kind of stuff. And it could be, um, well, we did do one uh, that might be sort of like that called The Cleansing Hour, which was about a, um, it's a pretty good movie. You guys will like this. It's a lower budgeted film. Damien Levesque directed it. And it's, um, it's about a, uh, a fake, uh, like a, 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 a streaming um, exorcism uh, where the, you know, this guy's, uh, you know, this handsome, fake priest is performing fake exorcisms but then shit goes bad right and <laughs> real demons come out and all that stuff but i guess like that that remember shocker the guy who would come through electrical devices and yeah the west craven, oh, west craven made of course yeah. and, and you know, they always have even in the 80s you have things coming out of the tv and right. i guess i guess you had that in the ring like video drone video drone and yeah and then the ring had uh, had, had that kind of thing so it's kind of been a theme. I wonder when that started. Did they start like uh, back in the uh, 20s? Was there a movie about, uh, you know, a radio that could kill you? <laughs> <laughs> I, guess, I guess they do it with mirrors, right? Like that's the earliest technology, the earliest uh, form of uh, like uh, uh, imagery that is a mirror, right? Things are always stepping out of a mirror, magic right. mirror. Wow. Right, yeah. So I guess it's been with us. Um, but I don't, I tend to get the calls um, be probably because you're judged on your body of work. And while we have a, a varied body of work, you know, we've done the Tim Allen Santa Claus movies, we've done subtle makeups, we've done giant brain bugs from Starship Troopers, whatever. Um, but people tend to come to us um, for very tactile, uh, 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 you know, um, meaty, uh, uh, you know, creature suits and um, makeups. 
but so they so they may not if it's like tech stuff like we don't tend to do a lot of robot looking like uh iron man suits and things we have done them but people you know and we can do that we've got the ability but you know you get pigeonholed um we got we got the the, the job on the thing because the director loved our work in alien resurrection oh he wow felt, he felt it was very fleshy and very organic, and that's what he, he was looking for. Going back to your uh, the short film Playtime, I, I wanted to ask you, how, how many people controlled the, the puppet of Billy? Well, um, we had, uh, let's see, on the body, it was probably two people on the body, and then uh, it was a minimal crew, because I did it a little differently. Like, normally, um, when we build a puppet like that, and if you look at Kevin Yeager's uh, behind-the-scenes pictures of Chucky, you'll see tons and tons of puppeteers. But things have changed now, so you, you can pre-program a lot of stuff. So his fate, his body was puppet was cable operated, right? So a guy with levers operating things, a couple guys, you know, operating the hands, all that stuff. His um, his neck was a direct, uh, we call a swash plate, but it's basically rod, you know, that, that allows it to do that. But his face was all pre-programmed, so all of the animation in the face was done by myself. And Mike West. Mike West is an is an animatronics engineer, and he did a lot of the build on the on the head, and the lip sync part. You want to pre-program all that to the dialogue so that you can sync it all up nicely. A live performer working with joysticks can't do a good enough job to really create good lip sync. So that's pre-programmed. But then this time, what I did differently was. Than, it, than we normally do. We normally let all the rest of the facial functions be live so we can be spontaneous. And if the actor changes up their performance, then the puppet can react differently and so on and so forth. But in this case, I thought, no, no I want to, I want, I got to minimize my onset crew and I want the opportunity to animate this thing as if it was a, a digital character. In digital animation or classic animation, you get the opportunity to frame by frame, tweak, go back, revise, change, edit. So that's what we did. So all of this stuff, I, I sat and, you know, okay, now we're going to do the brows. We'll do a pass at the brows. You know, what's that like? Now let's do the eyes and get the eyes moving. And I'm a big, um, I'm a big believer in um, paying attention to eye movement because it's so, it's the window to the soul. But like, if you, if you're talking to a person, um, studies have shown that you look at their eyes and your eyes track from left eye to right eye. You're looking at that person's left eye and the right, and then to the mouth. And it's something like, it's mainly you're looking at eyes during communication, but you occasionally dart down to the mouth. So if you notice in playtime, if you watch it again, when he gets nervous, he's got a lot of little eye movement where he's like, you know, <laughs> and, and so it was a chance for me to do like a very fun over the top cartoony performance. Um, in the way that I, I just kept imagining the way Pixar does it, right? Pixar does great facial performances where there's not much else is going on in the frame except for a character emoting. It's like, it goes back to silent films and, and all that stuff. Um, so anyway, the long and short answer is that, that we were able to press a button and Billy would do his entire facial performance. And then it was up to my three, three puppeteers on the outside to, to do the rest. That's awesome. Oh, that's awesome. I remember the eye twitching, like, subtly. Yeah. It was awesome. Oh, right, yeah. I, I even said that before you, you just explained it when I was watching. I said he, he had a lot of uh, facial attributes, which was mm. awesome. It looked very real. Mm. Um, I just I want to, like, just mention two, thing, two other things that I really loved about this film. One was the transition from the beginning of the film. So it, like, starts out as a 80, his 80s movie, and he comes out, he's about to kill the babysitter, and the VHS uh, stops, and it's like a transition into his, his real life. And I'm so glad you, you didn't use a DVD or yeah, Blu-ray. Right. It, was, it was hardcore VHS <laughs> that, was, that was done. Yeah, it's a blockbuster VHS. That's I even got, better. That's a blockbuster label on it, yeah. If, um, if, not knowing, if not knowing that you created this, Alec, and someone just presented it to me, it would be so easy to know that someone from, you know, like the 80s or the 70s yeah. actually, like, created this. It's just so obvious. Yeah, yeah. Well, like I said, you know, when you're steeped in something, right? Like, that's why I say it's autobiographical, because you do – I have these feelings. I have these feelings that I am antiquated, and uh, I'm, I'm being cut, sort of pushed to the sidelines. So my reaction is 
fuck that, then I'm going to make these the bitchinest sidelines ever, right? I'm going to just play in the sidelines. And um, so far, I'm having fun with it. But I wish, the, I wish that, uh, we, you know, we, we've got some great projects uh, in waiting in the wings. And, uh, you know, there's a werewolf movie. I've never done a werewolf. Oh, wow. A werewolf movie with, they want to do practical transformations. They're saying everything that I, I love to hear. So I'm hoping that, you know, we're going to be able to, you know, <clears throat> show you some great stuff. But I'm still working on the, um, in the sidelines, I'm still working on, on my own projects. And, um, and, and, you know, the goal is to, is to be able to start creating on a regular basis, start creating low budget, uh, practical effects based horror and sci-fi movies. You know, uh, could, so could I, just, you, I need to find that money source. So. Open could you up. tell us something that you're, uh, you're going to be working on? Or? Yeah, we have a, we have a film right now in um, post-production called Wellwood. Oh, and okay. Cool. It's a, it's a tight, smaller film. Um, and we opted to, you know, keep it. It's, it's a good, it's a good um, model for, for how you can do a, a low budget movie and get the most bang for your buck. But we've got, you know, we've got an alien and transitions and, and, you know, without telling you too much about it, um, a lot of practical effects plus digital, digital effects, digital enhancement effects and, and uh, so it's it's looking really good. Our cut's done. Our our sound work is done. Color grading is done. It looks fantastic. And we're just into the the last throws of VFX, and we'll drop those in, and hopefully that'll that'll uh, be out there and ready to ready for you to view and review. That That'd sounds awesome. exciting. Yeah, Especially, man. I love hearing practical effects still <laughs> being loves, done today. I obsessed. really do. I, I I hate CGI. It makes me so mad. Yeah. Well, you know what you hate? Here, may I, if I may posit this. I think what you hate, which is what I think most people fall into this, is the overuse of it and the misuse of CGI, right? Yes, absolutely. Because there are, if you watch virtually any movie nowadays, you're watching a bunch of CGI and you don't even know it. So if, if, it, if it's washing over you and it just looks naturalistic and real, like in um, The Revenant, if you've ever watched the behind the scenes on The Revenant, where they added entire snowscapes to non scenery yeah my god that stuff is and also the, the the it's funny because the i spoke to someone who worked on the, in the vfx uh, of the revenant and the director had been touting that we just went out into the wilderness and it was just me and a camera and leo and uh no special lighting or anything that's that's, what, right. that's how genius my cinematographer <laughs> and this yeah, was going, yeah and about 300 vfx guys that had to bounce <laughs> <laughs> in digital right so that you had a movie and then if you watch i laughed even more when you watch the bts of that talking about like going out into the wilderness and all, you see them like there's a drone shot and there's like the, the camera crew and the actors are there and you're like oh look at them it's snowing that looks look at that freaking um waterfall they're standing there and you pull out and you realize they're just in a little corner of like what looks like a state park with beautiful concrete walkways and a bridge right next to them. And then there's the, then there's the base camp of 50 trailers. And, and, uh, and, the, <laughs> right. and then you read that, of course, DiCaprio had a heated suit on underneath. All that. <laughs> of course he was wearing a dry suit when he was in the freezing cold water. No, no movie studio would allow you to make a movie they wouldn't insure you if you're gonna if you're gonna just tromp out into the wilderness and and uh, and put your star at risk like that. So it, right. well, it's funny to me to hear um, passionate actors or uh, or directors talk about things. You're like, did you forget that you know there was a lady with a breakfast burrito standing next to you for you know to hand <laughs> to you in the middle of this savage wilderness? You know? <laughs> Whatever. I I think Alan, going back to. Uh, the, the CGI effects. I think the, the perfect example for like the best usage of it would be Jurassic Park. Yeah. yeah. It's still, like, it's that's cool. the perfect example. Still holds up. In my own resume, which I always like to bring up, um, it, it, it would be um, Starship Troopers. Yeah. I love right. that movie, man. Yeah, that's it's a great awesome. movie. It looks real, too. Yeah, it looks a lot of fun. Still, it still looks great. And um, it would also be Alien versus Predator. Alien versus Predator had a lot of digital stuff and a lot of practical. We had our giant queen, but they also had a fully digital queen. 
Um, and there were times where our giant queen had digital arms so it could like grab at the spear that was stuck in its head and stuff. So there are those uses where, where they're very well thought out. And that, that comes from, uh, you know, people who are not being territorial. Um, sometimes, you know, in my, in my past, I don't see it as much now, but in the past when um, digital companies, you know, it was very expensive. To, it's always been expensive to do digital effects. Getting cheaper and people do them themselves, beautifully cheap. But if you're going through the corporate model, digital effects are, are still very expensive, top of the line digital effects. But um, there was a time like in the 90s and early 2000s where you would get um, digital effects companies, at, you know, you'd sit at the big round table to discuss how the movie's going to be made. And they were very aggressively trying to cut all practical effects out of the picture so that they could just take more work, right? right charge those prices. It's, a, it, you know, they, it, they have a lot of costs in, in doing effect, but I don't see that as much anymore. I see much more collaboration. I think it's because digital effects companies have been beat up a lot now and their profit ratios have dropped considerably. They can no longer hide behind the mystique of the technique and charge high prices. Plus with all the global outsourcing, there's stuff being done in China and in, uh, in, uh, in Asia, you know, where people are making, 30 cents an hour, 50 cents an hour, mm. um, which is why at, a lot, at the end of a lot of big effects movies, you'll see a bunch of names of, that are you know, foreign, non-Western names. And again, it's not personal, it's business. Like how else are you gonna make a movie that still costs $200, $200 million? How, how, how are you gonna make that movie affordable? You gotta outsource. And that's mm. what, that's, that has kind of you know, beat up the, uh, the VFX companies a lot too. So they don't tend to want to take on more than they can handle. And a lot of those big companies have now become fractured and they're, they've turned into a lot of smaller companies, which are more like networks of individuals working rather than big monolithic uh, uh, companies doing stuff. But, but uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I want to make sure that I don't come off as just anti-digital because I'm not at all. It's an amazing tool. I, I just want, all tools to be used in their appropriate way, you know. Isn't I like, that? Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I just, one, one last thing. I just I Come like it, building, building a house. Like if you were to, if you're building a house, you don't just arbitrarily say I'm not going to use a circular saw. You know, you use right. whatever you need to build that house. Right. I was gonna. I just was gonna ask you. Was that like the theme you were trying to convey at the end of playtime when he, uh, Billy, he kind of embraces the CGI, right? So like at the end, his puppeteers are green screen. So yeah. I, I, I kind of what came off, and you could, you could tell me what, what it actually was. To me, it was like CGI is okay if it's done properly. I, yeah. that's kind of the message I was getting. Yeah, and that there can be a marriage of the two. Right. That the it makes need not be exclusive. And this is how it is, you know, that again, the, in the film, it's the, it's the, uh, it, it's a, it's a guy who's set in his ways because that's all he knows. And it isn't until he gets knocked down to um, ground zero that he, he opens his mind to a new way, right? That doesn't negate him. Um, and then in, in the end, he goes to give his girl some flowers at the Chuck E. Cheese where she works. I love that. That's funny. <laughs> That's so funny, too, that he, the girl, uh, she's in a band now that works for Chuck E. Cheese. Yeah. Lily, her name's Lily, right? The, yeah. Uh... yeah, Lily. Lily. <laughs> and Lily. And, um, uh, yeah, and that, that was my daughter doing the voice of Lily, by the way. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Well, that's cool. And you, you did the, I think I asked you before, but you did the voice of Billy, right? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Um, one of the last questions I'll ask you before we'll uh, end this podcast is uh, what advice can you give to like uh, up and coming directors that are trying to make their short horror films and like, should they keep going, submit it to film festivals, like network? I, I'm, I'm, this is where I, I, you know, like generally speaking, you know, people ask me my advice of getting in the business to kind of, to kind of replicate my career. I don't think at this point you could replicate my career in the practical effects world because right. things so much, but in terms of filmmaking people, what am I trying to say here? People often say 
and I think they're just kind of regurgitating something that they've heard. Do a short, get a whole bunch of attention, and get a movie deal. And I feel like, yeah, okay, it's kind of like, you know, you know, how do you, how do you cure cancer? Well, first come up with the cure. <laughs> um, but, but like I see, there's just, YouTube is inundated with, uh, with short films, just everywhere short films. And some of them are really great and some of them are not. And a lot of them have great production value and some do not. Um, so I don't really know the landscape and I don't know that, I, I don't automatically buy into do a short film, put it in festivals. Like you'll spend your time doing that short film however long it takes you. And then you'll be doing festivals for another two years after that. And I personally would rather be doing another film. And That's not the boat I'm in right now. I, I have two yeah. films uh, running the festivals and I'm trying to like scrap for another idea and, uh, you know, trying to gain attention as, as much as I can to try to like break into the, the horror industry. But like you said, like it, you can't just wait. You know, they, some film festivals will accept you, reject you. And it, what's crazy now is because of COVID, there's not even networking. So any film festivals that I, I, I got on or got into, everything is online. So like yeah. to go meet the person or the, the, the producer who has a deal or wants you to write something. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's difficult. But then I just, just from your film, right? And I, I watched it and I was like, jealous i was like why did i think of that that's such a great idea mm -hmm. and i really still i know this is cliche the sound but like a great story just rises to the occasion a great story or a great script like i, I thought that playtime had an excellent script with a excellent message and and it was creative and innovative oh. so that cream rises to the top no matter like what i don't know yeah well i'll send you links to um some of my other short films and, and you'll see they're a little, they were done be, even before they were done in uh, before high def. So these were probably done in the early two thousands, but all I was trying to do was with them was quickly. Cause I was so sick of um, you know, how long everything takes. Right. So I thought, what if I write a script in a day and then plan prep shoot in a day, edit in a day, and then I'm done. And in, in three days of work, I'm done. Right. Ish. I didn't right. necessarily, I failed on, on those, but that was the goal, right? Um, but my, my thinking was, I'm not going to have any effects in them. They're just going to be comedy. Um, I'm just going to play with it, get better as a filmmaker under an, in a no pressure situation. I'm not going to be sending these things out. Um, and in fact, I, they, I, I don't even have them up on my uh, YouTube channel because uh, why? Oh, because they're just not related to, to ADI stuff, you know, but I, I don't know. I look at like the, the guy that I worked with on um, Annabelle creation, David Sandberg. Awesome movie. Uh, yeah. And he, you know, have you seen lights out his, uh, his short that he did? Yeah. Yes. The short is, I think the short is actually better than the, uh, the actual film. It's just so oh, much scarier. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that thing. Like, you know, how do you sustain that? It's a moment, right? It's right. A, right. But David is a great example of a, of a guy who, who he's very studious and very knowledgeable about cameras and writing. And, um, and that is a, that's a guy that made that short thing work. But all he did is his wife, him, their apartment, a hallway. That's it. That is it. And, and, uh, and that I think is, is fantastic. So I'd rather like even building the Billy character, you know, is a big, it's an undertaking. It's a big right. word. Like if you had come up with that idea, you'd have to be calling around, coming to somebody like me, and you'd be you'd have a heart attack when I tell you how much that thing costs. You know? <laughs> sure, you're right. Yeah. So so uh, so, but if you can do something like Sandberg did with Lights Out, and and I think he just put it on the internet, didn't he? It wasn't a it wasn't a. Um, a, it, a uh, I did see it a couple of years ago. He he actually made a, another good one during quarantine where he just used shadows. Yeah, I saw that, and it's and they had the little reflective stuff on the eyes. Yeah, yeah. just simple concepts that are like very effective and probably not costly. And like yeah. you said, you, you're not hiring a big um, crew to do. Yeah. It. I think he did it with his wife and his friend. It was three people. Yeah, no, and that that shows you what you can do. And that I think is <laughs> like unfortunately in the effects business, we tend to uh, well, unfortunately, it's what we love. So you tend to see a lot of like 
elaborate short films that pour tons of money and, and well, effort, maybe not money, but lots of effort. People, lots of favors are pulled to have full on space battles and guys, aliens and all this stuff. But then at the end of the day, you're like, eh, you know, I appreciate the production value, but I'm not really that into the story or, or what's mm. going on. And so with this, and I'll, on it, quite honestly, I don't know if you've seen my film Harbinger Down. That's a little bit, Harbinger Down is, is, is a, it's, a, it's an homage film with lots of production value, but a story that is openly, as I, as I said I would do, that we did a Kickstarter for this film. And I said, I'm going to give you a film that's, that'll gives you the feeling of, that you had when you watched The Thing and, you know, and Alien. I'm going to use those two. So it's sort of a mashup. And, right. but, and it was great. I, I, I loved working on it. I think it's a, it's a good, solid monster movie. It's a Corman-style, fun monster movie. But that's why, with Playtime, I want to do something with a little more heart, something with more humor, and something that... Um, is grounded in my own personal experience. Yeah, no, it, it had that movie definitely had a lot of heart, and I, I don't, I don't usually, I like the morbid endings, but not this time. Like, I, I like the happy ending that this guy, this this doll gets. Yeah, well, that's because because he you saw, <laughs> you saw the terrible situation he was in. You're like, please let this guy get something out of this. Yeah. <laughs> well, as like as a fan, like Anthony was saying before, and uh, like if you're an outsider just looking in or just watching something, like I agree with Anthony, you know, I love movies from the 80s and the 90s and like to see that like overcome and you know, it's 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 awesome cuz those are the movies we we um, you know, I, the movie Dolls, Chucky, all these, you know, Jurassic Park even even though it had like the CGI, it was a lot of animatronics. I love when it looks real. I think, in my opinion, the Jurassic World, some of them, don't look as good as the original movie. I, I don't agree. know why. I but... agree. Well, because there's nothing there, you know, like the, it's, it's when you have a, a, a real animatronic thing there, glinting in the rain, that's something that a digital artist must match. It's right. not just out of the imagination. They must match that thing or it doesn't work. And it's, a, it's a hard for digital artists but they do it and they can do it. And that's what makes it, I think, I think whenever you have an animatronic version of something in a, in a film, even if they're CGI versions, it, it makes the CGI better. Same thing with Starship Troopers. We had full on giant bugs, which you can see on my YouTube channel. You have a lot of good stuff on there. I was like, you were saying the Starship Troopers. I, I was looking at all the different models that you were doing. I, I love all that, all that stuff. Yeah. So cool. No, so do I, man. I want, I, I uh, appreciate that. And, I'm hoping for the opportunity to do, to do much, much more of it. Mm. Alec, thank you so much for coming thank on the podcast. Everybody, please yeah, thank you, Alec. check out Playtime. This movie was awesome. I'm going to put the link in the description below. Please check out his YouTube channel. It's called Studio ADI. I, like I said early in the podcast, if you are interested in what goes into like horror, sci-fi, action, this guy has done the best of the best. Please check it out. Alec, thank you again for coming on our show. This is Pop from the Crypt. We'll see you next time. Thank you both. Love you guys. Thank you. Good, Alec. Thank you.